Hey, Frap, did you finish that list of solutions to the Tegu Iguana problem? Uh, looks like you got it right here. Let's see. Poop in all drinking. Frap, come on. We're not pooping in drinking water. That's not going to solve anything. Jeez, come on. Take this seriously. Eat that giant rat. You mean the dog? That's a member of our family. He was here before you, and you know how he feels about being called a rat. Sleep. I mean, I want to officially rename Tig. Oh my god, Frap, that is genius. Hey guys, how's it going? We are back with part three of this possible five-part series. I think I might do at least four. I don't know about five yet, but we'll get there. Uh, but today, we're going to talk about possible solutions to invasive species problem like the iguana and tegu in Florida. Now, it's not really easy to put together an effective solution. I don't want to downplay that. I only did about a week's worth of literary review on this, and I really came up with just very general things. Um, and it's specifically really hard to tackle the problem after an invasive species takes hold. So we're going to discuss a little bit about that, but there really needs to be a lot more research done on this topic to really figure out some effective solutions, since this is a very big topic that not a lot of people have really thought through thoroughly. Uh, but first, before we get to it, make sure to check that lower right hand corner, hit that subscribe button, hit the bell, leave a like, leave a comment. Let's get to the video. In summary, a lot of the research focuses on and promotes forming guidelines and procedures for preventing invasive species before they can take hold in a new area. A lot of the research does not focus on what to do when an invasive species gets established. Uh, that is a lot harder of a task, and the main point here is that we should promote more procedures to actually stop invasive species from getting to the point that the Guan and Tegu are in Florida. I know that's not a great solution to what we're dealing with now, and I will say one thing. Uh, there has been some research done on the effectiveness of harvesting, and that's when people go out, remove them from the wild and such. There's been successes with that. Now, there's some favorable and unfavorable characteristics. I'll show that up in a table right here. Uh, those just display where uh, usually harvesting is most effective. Um, and things like, or uh, animals like the Burmese python, they're not really that easy to locate and find, and that's probably one of the most difficult parts of doing some type of harvesting and removing them. Uh, but this has been shown to be very effective in multiple different literatures. So uh, this is one way that we could take care of it after the fact. Obviously, when you're dealing with a species that's really taken hold of an area, uh, you really need a good amount of people taking care of the problem. And that's difficult in itself. There's a lot of money at play and such. Uh, it's a hard task, and I'm not going to downplay it. There, it is a hard task to take care of an invasive species problem once it already happened. So there's not a lot of good answers in research for that. Like I said, though, the real thing to do to stop invasive species is to implement procedures and such that will stop invasive species before they can start. And I said this in the last video. The number one thing we need to know as well is why so many people and what leads to it release, you know, animals to the wild. And that contributes. I hopefully didn't downplay that in my previous two videos. I did say that there was other contributions to, you know, the guana getting started in the wild. But there are people who release, you know, these animals in the wild. And that is, uh, you know, not a good thing that does contribute to the issue. Uh, so we do need to understand why that is, why people do that. Uh, in this table, you'll see here, uh, this whole research article focused sort of on what uh, probabilities or what really leads to people releasing animals to the wild. Um, the top three here were the number of imports, price, and their mass. Those were the top three things that led to people releasing their animals to the wild, and that actually makes a lot of sense. Uh, if we look at the next figure, we can see a couple graphs that um, point out that the more quantity, like I said, the higher percentage of release probability. Uh, the lower the price, the higher percentage of release probability. And the size, the higher re percentage of release possibility. So those are three main things that really, you know, added together uh, can really lead to, you know, reptiles being released in the wild. One last graph in this research article actually shows how some of these connect. We talked about the quantity imported, the price range, the mass. It shows that, and I know these might be a little confusing to look at, but the darker portions, I believe, is blue on your end. I got black and white here. Um, the darker portions show where there's a high probability. In the first graph, graph A, you can see that uh, there is a connection between mass and the quantity of imports that lead to a higher probability, the higher uh, number of imports there are, and the larger the reptile is, basically. 
and there is um, sort of a connection between the quantity of imports and the longevity of that animal. So you can see uh, as the longevity gets older or higher and the imports get higher, uh, there's a higher probability that that animal or reptile will be released to the wild. These evidence-based statistics are what we should be using as foundational laws and legislation. These are the things that need to be taken care of, monitored, whatever, and looked at to form good laws to prevent invasive species, not an outright ban. We look at why animals are being released, we can stop it. Now, this last piece of research we're going to look at is actually based on some legislation in the EU to combat invasive species. Uh, I want to start by reading a little bit of an excerpt that I think makes a very good point and is pretty much what I'm promoting. Um, it says, The legislation entered into force on January 1st, 2015, and is commendably underpinned by a consensus among scientists and policymakers that prevention is better than cure. Basically, we need to stop it before it starts and not wait until it's here to take care of it. I think that's very important. So I did just want to state that that's a, you know, a belief in research as well, not just me. Uh, additionally, we're going to look at two tables. Uh, basically, these are things that need to be tackled in order to create effective legislation to combat invasive species before they, you know, get introduced into a new ecosystem and take over. Because like I just said, they're looking for prevention, not a cure. So in this table right here, you'll see sort of a list of things that they believe that they need to tackle in order to successfully implement um, this law in the EU. They talk about uh, creating an inclusive and dynamic list of species of concern that can be dropped on and off and don't have to go through many, you know, procedures or whatever you want to call it, many iterations of trying to get them on and off the list. Uh, so it's very flexible, pretty much. Uh, they also talk about budgetary restraints, which is, of course, a problem. You really need to understand uh, how much money rules the world, and uh, that's a big portion of any law. Um, and lastly, it's really about, um, you know, responsibility, regional cooperation, observation of industry and stuff, and us working all together. We all have to contribute and sort of respect nature. Um, that's really what it comes down to. Uh, in this next table, I just want to show this real quick. They just list some of the areas that need to be researched more. I thought this would be interesting because, you know, we're, we're talking about how little uh, invasive research, invasive species research to combat invasive species is, is out there and uh, how we need more of that. So they believe these are some of the topics that need to be analyzed more in research so we can combat invasive species better. Before giving my concluding remarks, I did want to give a word on permits and what I think about them. I do think permits are a good idea. I do think the way they're implemented in the U.S. right now is just way too high in terms of qualifications. Let's take the venomous permit in Florida. I definitely think you should have a venomous permit. Uh, but to get a venomous permit in Florida, you not only have to log a thousand hours, but it has to be so with someone who has a venomous permit already. But people with a venomous permit, they don't want to take in apprentices unless they really know the person, because then there's legal ramifications if they get bit. So it really isn't too easy for people to get that permit. I feel like anybody should be able to get a permit uh, as long as they work towards it and, you know, meet the qualifications. But I don't think the qualifications should be something that not everybody can achieve. Uh, so I do think permits help and I do think they have a place, but they need to be rethought. Uh, and I, I really think the way they're doing it right now is just too much. So what is my conclusion here? My conclusion is a couple things. For one, I am not qualified to make a conclusion. For two, um, there is a lot that goes into it, and I think it's pretty obvious. The number one thing I take out of this is that prevention is the key. A cure is so much harder, and there's so much less known on effective methods to reduce wild populations of invasive species and such like that. So I think prevention should be the future, but we really need to do more research now to figure out how to tackle invasive species problems that are already established since there's not a lot of stuff in literature right now on that. Uh, so that's really my conclusion there. Uh, I don't have like a 10 point plan on how we're gonna tackle the tegus and iguanas in Florida. Uh, it would take a lot more than a week to come up with that and a lot more than just me. Uh, I am also not a biologist or anything, so I can't really speak to that as well as some other more qualified individuals. Uh, this is just kind of my thoughts. Uh, I think this is really the direction I'm trying to say we should go instead of straight out ban. So that's what I think. That's what I think is best. 
Uh, I already showed kind of how a band isn't really effective, but there are other methodologies that aren't a band uh, that are effective to dealing with invasive species and how we should really tackle invasive, invasive species going forward. So let me know if you agree with me, what your thoughts on it are. Uh, I would really love to hear back from you. Of course, constructive, be nice, but uh, I really appreciate it. Anyway, guys, make sure to check that lower right-hand corner, hit the subscribe button, hit the bell, leave a like and comment, and we will see you next time. I don't know why I said we, it's only me here. I guess me and Frap, but Frap already ducked out halfway through the video, like always, but anyway, thanks.